As the pastor mentioned, we're going through the whole Old Testament talking about who Yeshua uh, was. In, because Yeshua is in each and every book in the Old Testament. So this is very um, important. And so just like we have been doing, let's first, um, let's recap, right? Who is Yeshua from Genesis to Job, where we ended last time? So I know most of you should know this by now, but uh, who is Yeshua in Genesis? Yes, the seed of the woman. Who is Yeshua in Exodus? It says, for Messiah, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. 1 Corinthians 5.17. The Passover lamb, yes. And who is Yeshua in Leviticus? The great high priest. And who is Yeshua in Numbers? It says, and Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. Yes, he's the smitten rock, the rock that was struck. And who is Yeshua in Deuteronomy? Yahweh, your Elohim, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Yes, Yeshua is the prophet, like Moses. Who is Yeshua in the book of Joshua? And he said, nay, but as captain of the host of Yahweh, I, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Who is Yeshua in the book of Joshua? Yes, the captain of Yahweh's hosts. And who is Yeshua in the judges? It says, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. Who is Yeshua in the judges? The great and final judge, yes. Who is Yeshua in the book of Ruth? The kinsman redeemer, yes. It says, now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Yeshua is our kinsman redeemer because he bought us out of the hands of sin. So who is Yeshua in Samuel? We remember it says in Luke, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Yes, the anointed one. And that's um, the picture that uh, Brother Dane was talking about in his testimony. Yeshua in the kings, it says, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Who is Yeshua in the kings? King of kings, yes. That's an easy one. Yeshua in Chronicles says, so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Elohim. Who is Yeshua? Yes, he is the glory of the house of Elohim, of Yahweh. And in Ezra, it says, this is Nicodemus, John 3 verse 2. Uh, um, came to Yeshua by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, from Elohim, for no one can do these signs that you do unless Yahweh is with him. Who is Yeshua in the book of Ezra? The teacher, yes, come from Yahweh. Yeshua in Nehemiah, the spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to deal with to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Who is Yeshua in, the, in Nehemiah? Yes, Yeshua rebuilds our broken lives, the rebuilder of our broken lives. In Esther, it says, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Who is Yeshua? That's quoted from John. Yeshua is our protector, right? The invisible protector of his people. We don't see him, but he is there. And those that follow him are protected by him. In Job, it says, Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Yeshua Messiah is Lord to the glory of Elohim the Father. Who is Yeshua in Job? Yes, the sovereign Lord. Now, who is Yeshua in the Psalm? This is where we begin, right? Now, here's what we need to understand about the Psalms. The book of Psalms is essentially the hymn book or the song book of Yahweh's people. Psalms are songs and poem. And the first song we sang today was what? Psalm 23. That's the song we sang. So Psalms are songs, right? Now, the Psalms cover about 450 years from the time of King Saul, 1050 BC, to the time of the fall of Judah. There are 150 Psalms in the Bible. Now, they were written by different people, but David wrote about half of them. So David is the prime author of the Psalms. Now, the, the Psalms talk about different things, right? So the Psalms cover many topics. They praise Yahweh. Some are crying to Yahweh. Some are about thanking Yahweh or celebrating Yahweh's Torah, like Psalm 119, and many more, right? But what we realize is that in every single psalm, Yeshua is pictured in many psalms. Yeshua is pictured in, in many psalms. But so it's hard to say, well, in the whole of the psalms, Yeshua is, is this. Because he's pictured in many different psalms. So we're going to take the most famous psalm to represent Yeshua. Now what is the most famous psalm? No. The most famous psalm? No. <laughs> it is Psalm 23. <laughs> Sorry, I could not hear you guys back there. So, huh? Yes. Most well-known, most famous is Psalm 23. Many people will quote that, right? So then, who is Yeshua in Psalm 23? For those of you who know, who have read it, it is easy. Yes, he's the shepherd, but not just shepherd. Yeshua is the good shepherd, right? Yeshua is the good shepherd. Psalm 23 verse 1 says what? Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want, or meaning I shall lack nothing. So Yahweh is not just a shepherd. I mean, Yeshua is not just a shepherd. He's the good shepherd. We see this from John 10 verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Because we see throughout the Bible that pastors and other people that are head over churches are also shepherds. Yeshua says, I am the good shepherd. Because there are good shepherds and bad shepherds. But Yeshua is the good shepherd, right? So Yeshua is the good shepherd because he gave up his life. So we could have eternal life. Psalm 23, verse 2, going down, says what? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeshua is the good shepherd. Yeshua is also the good shepherd because first, he loves his sheep. He showed his love by dying for his sheep on the cross so that the sheep may have eternal life. Also, Yeshua is the good shepherd because he leads his sheep to green pastures. Yeshua feeds us with his word, which will make us grow to become more like him. He's a good shepherd. Yeshua is the good shepherd also because he leads us to still waters. We just read that. The word is life to the believer. It satisfies the soul. When you drink the word, which leads to eternal life, you will never thirst. We just sang a song about coming to the well. And whoever comes to the well will never thirst. Also, Yeshua is the good shepherd because he restores our souls, right? When we were dead in our sins, he gave us life. When we are down, his spirit comforts us and lifts us up. When we start to doubt, his spirit reassures us. His spirit leads us on to eternal life. Yeshua is the good shepherd. 
He's also the good shepherd because he leads us in paths of righteousness. Yeshua's spirit leads us on the road of righteousness, and we are sanctified daily. That's what a good shepherd does. He leads his sheep in the right paths, right? And as you read Psalm 23, you realize that David is talking about what? The believer's life of sanctification. When you, ha when you have him, you lack nothing because before you had Yeshua, you had lack, right? So, for example, he leads us through, uh, the, 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 in Psalm 23, the, he talks about the believer's life of sanctification. So here we see, right, that he leads us down the road of righteousness, sometimes through times of trouble, shadows of darkness, right? But he is with you. Do you see that sheep? Going through, what is that? It's walking through alligators, right? The sheep is walking through alligators. So, but Yahweh is with you. His road and staff, they comfort you. So, so we see that, that David is talking about sanctification, meaning from the day that you know Yahweh, when Yahweh becomes your shepherd, all the way until the end. We know he's talking about sanctification, Why? What does he say at the very end? And I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So when you read Psalm 23, it's Yeshua leading you down the road to sanctification. And if you keep following the good shepherd, you will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Right? Now, dwelling in the house of Yahweh forever is only for the sheep that follow Yeshua, the good shepherd. Yeshua is the good shepherd, but are you an obedient sheep? Do you follow Yeshua? In John 10, 14, Yeshua said, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own, sh sorry, I'm reading the next slide. <laughs> 10, 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. So, can you say you know Yeshua, the good shepherd? Are you a sheep that is following him? Right? In John 10, 3, verse 4, he said, The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The obedient sheep know Yeshua's voice. Do you know Yeshua? Do you know his voice? Is he leading you? Is he your shepherd? What does he say in John 10 verse 5? He says, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So is this true? Do sheep only know their master's voice? Will sheep refuse to follow a stranger? Who here has sheep? Nobody. You're a city folk. You don't have sheep, right? But we thank. So let's see, though. Is it true that sheep only follow their master's voice? So, so let's watch this little video here. One more time. Oh, my 
They are coming. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you just made him go away. Oh my God. Was that cool or what? Oh yeah. <laughs> you will never have the same again. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe the video is coming. So it's true. Sheep only follow their master's voice because they know their master, their shepherd. Sheep will not follow somebody else's voice. If they don't know you, they will not follow you. So, do you know your master? Do you know Yeshua? Are you led by his spirit? You should be. Because only those who follow the good shepherd, only those will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So follow the good shepherd. Okay. So now who is Yeshua in the book of Proverbs? So the Proverbs are a co collection of wise sayings, right? And King Solomon was the author of the book of Proverbs, right? There were a few other authors too. In Proverbs 1 verse 1, we're told the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So the purpose of the Proverbs is to help Yahweh's people understand wisdom and apply it to their daily lives. That's the purpose of the book, right? What is wisdom and how do you apply that to your daily life? Those who listen to and apply the Proverbs are wise. Those who don't are foolish, right? Now Solomon, he was very wise, right? And his, his wisdom made him famous. Many people travel long distances just to listen to Solomon speak, right? Many people. And for example, here in 2 Chronicles 9 verse 1, we're told, now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test him with hard questions, having a very great retinue and camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all she, that she had on her, her mind. So people traveled just to hear this wise man speak. Right? And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from Solomon that he could not explain to her. So all the hard questions that she had, how do you do this? What, what, what happens if I were to, to do this? He answered all her questions, right? And we're told, and when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants and their clothing, his cupbearers, all these mighty, wonderful things that he had been blessed with, she was breathless. She was taken away because she had never seen a king like this before. No one, no other king in all the world was like Solomon. So his wisdom, Solomon's wisdom made him famous. And we're told, right, in verse 22, that the king Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom. Just imagine that. All the presidents and all the officials all around the world traveling just to hear this person speak. To hear his wisdom which Elohim had put into his mind. Right? And we're told... And Elohim gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breath of mind like the sign of the seashore so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed all 
the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs were 1,005. And people from all nations all over the world came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. So Solomon was super wise, wiser than any other king. And we know we're told in Matthew of the, the wise men that came from the east. And here they're mentioned, Solomon was wiser than them. So, so Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. People came from all over the earth just to hear the wisdom of Solomon. This wisdom made him very famous. He was very famous for his wealth and wisdom. Now, Pastor Micah did two sermons on who Yeshua is in the Proverbs. We also debated a lot about it in a Bible study. So most of you should know this, right? You should know this. Who is Yeshua in the book of Proverbs? Yeshua is the wisdom of Elohim. You see, Solomon did not acquire that wisdom by himself. He asked for it, and Yahweh gave it to him. What does 2 Chronicles 9.23 say? And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which who? Which Elohim had put into his mind, right? And we just read about how the queen of Sheba, sometimes called the queen of the south, came to visit Solomon to hear his wisdom. We also read about how kings... And many people traveled all over the earth just to hear Solomon speak, right? Because Solomon was very wise. All the kings of the earth traveled just to hear the words of Solomon. Now, what did Yeshua say about people listening to wisdom? What did he say? In Matthew 12 and verse 42, he says, The queen of the south, talking about the queen of Sheba, will rise up at the judgment with this generation. And condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So what is Yeshua saying here? Yeshua is saying the queen of Sheba, like many other kings from all over the world, came from far away to hear Solomon speak. Yet the Pharisees and the scribes and many people of Yeshua's day were not eager to listen to Yeshua. Right? Yeshua is greater than Solomon. Why? He was greater than Solomon because the wisdom that was in Solomon was Yeshua himself. It was Yeshua himself. That wisdom is Yeshua. And we know this. Why? 1 Corinthians 1.24 tells us, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah, the power of Elohim, the wisdom of Elohim. Yeshua is the very wisdom of Yahweh, the same wisdom that was in Solomon. But Yeshua was greater than Solomon because Solomon's wisdom, as great as it was, it was finite. Solomon could not know everything. He could not. But Yeshua knew all things. He was Yahweh himself, the only wise God. Today, Today we are blessed, right? We are blessed today because we don't have to travel to Jerusalem to hear Solomon's wisdom. We don't have to travel to Israel to hear the, the wisdom of Yeshua. We don't. The wisdom of Yahweh lives right within us. Because Yeshua, the wisdom of Yahweh lives in us. Right? The Holy Spirit, the wisdom of Yahweh, greater than all the wisdom of Solomon, which people came to hear from all over the world, lives right within us. The same wisdom. You see, we need to listen to wisdom. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. That's where our wisdom comes from. See, those, those who refuse to listen to wisdom, like those who refuse to listen to Yeshua, in the flesh will be condemned. 
there will be no condemnation for those who listen to wisdom. Those who listen to the Holy Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit, Yeshua, is wisdom within us. We are wise if we listen to the Holy Spirit. And we are fools if we don't. Because the very wisdom that people came to seek in Solomon, that was Yeshua himself. He is the very wisdom of Yahweh. All right. Moving right along. Who is Yeshua in Ecclesiastes? Okay, now, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, right? Many say he wrote it when he was a lot older, right? Also, we just, we just talked about how Solomon was wealthy, wise, and famous. Now, Solomon is older, but the words of Ecclesiastes are not like the words of Proverbs, right? The words of Ecclesiastes are like words of regret and sorrow. They are words of emptiness and, and meaninglessness. Throughout the book, Solomon writes that everything is vanity. Everything is meaningless. He says life has no meaning. Right? He says the sun rises and then sets, rises and then sets, rises and then sets. Is there a point to that? There is no meaning to that. Right? We, we work hard all day for many years and then we die. Everything we worked for, all that you had, is taken by others. So what's the point of all that work? And babies are born today, but they will grow old and die. Who will remember them? Will your great-grandchildren even know who you were? Do you know who your great-grandparents were? See, Solomon concluded that life is meaningless. But, but why? Why did King Solomon come to such a conclusion? Why? I mean, why, why would someone who had all the wealth, the fame, the power, and beauty come to the conclusion that life was meaningless? Aren't these things what everybody wants? Wealth, fame, and power, right? So what happened to Solomon? What did he do to come to such a conclusion? Well, let's find out. Okay. Solomon was a king. And Yahweh had set up laws for all kings to obey. All of them, right? In Deuteronomy 17, 14, and verse 15, we're told, When you come to the land that Yahweh, your El, is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom Yahweh, your El, will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So in the Torah, there are kings for, there are laws for kings to obey. So we go on. Verse 16. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself. That's the law for kings. Or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since Yahweh has said to you you shall never return that way again okay so did Solomon obey Yahweh's laws did did Solomon acquire many horses for himself and did he cause the people to go back to Egypt in order to acquire many horses did he do that well, let's all turn to 2 Chronicles 9, 28. Get your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles 9, 28. Second <laughs> Chronicles 9, 28. And he tells us, right? 
and horses were imported from Solomon, from Egypt, and from all lands. So exactly what Yahweh said, do not acquire horses, not, not acquire many horses for yourself. We're told in 2 Chronicles 9, 28, horses were imported from e Egypt for Solomon. Now, let's take a guess, right? Because the law says acquiring many horses, not just a horse, right? So, so how many horses do you think Solomon had? <laughs> First Kings 4, 26, Solomon had 40,000 stores of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen, right? He had horses. And then in continuing with the laws for the kings, we're told, Deuteronomy 17 and verse 17, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Okay, so there are two laws here, the wives and the silver and gold. So let's start with the silver and gold. Did Solomon acquire for himself lots of silver and gold? Did he? We're told in 1 Kings 10, 14 and 15. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that which came from the explorers and from the business of, of the merchants, and from all the kings of the west and from all the governors of the land. So Solomon went about acquiring plenty of gold from all over the world, right? And we are told, right, that King Solomon, he made 200 lar large shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shield. Just shields of pure gold, right? And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three miners of gold went to each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon, right? I mean, Solomon acquired plenty, plenty of gold. We're told, furthermore, all King Solomon's drinking vessels were made of gold. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. I mean, <laughs> not only did he break the law, but he went above and beyond, right? And we're told to not acquire too much silver for yourself. None were of silver, right? Because silver was considered as nothing in the days of Solomon. There was so much silver that it was like nothing. Nothing, right? So, did Solomon acquire for himself lots of silver and gold? Yes, he did. Which means what? He broke Yahweh's laws. And then the first part of that law says, and he shall not acquire many wives for himself lest his heart turn away, right? So, did Solomon acquire for himself many wives? 1 Kings 11, 1 and 2 says, Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, and Ammonite, and Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations considering which Yahweh had said to the people, Yahweh had told them, do not marry from among these people. Do not enter into marriage with them because why? They will turn your heart away from Yahweh. But Solomon, oh, he clung to these in love. He just loved them, right? He just loved all these foreign women, right? Three and four tells us he had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines. And those same wives, they did exactly what Yahweh told him. They turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not truly, wholly true to Yahweh, his Elohim, as was the heart of David, his father. So Solomon had 700 wives. 700 wives. Now just think about it. Do you wonder how? What did his wedding look like, right? I mean, his wedding probably looked like that, right? I now pronounce you man and 700 wives, right? That's probably what Solomon's wedding looked like, right? 
So, Solomon did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh and did not wholly follow Yahweh as David his father had done. Solomon didn't follow Yahweh completely with the whole heart. So Solomon, right, he broke Yahweh's laws and stopped following Yahweh. Now King Solomon is old, and he says, life is meaningless, right? So, in Ecclesiastes, who is Yeshua? That's tough. <laughs> the meaning of life. That is tough. I bet, that, yeah, I was sure nobody would get it here. So, well, let me help you, right? What's located at 2100 Echo Street, Pittsburgh, PA 15210? Okay, right? Echo Street. What does echoes mean? Do we know? Echoes is a name derived from the Greek term ecclesia, which means congregation. Echoes is the name derived from the Greek term ecclesia, which means congregation. So most likely this street here is named Echoes because there was an ecclesia, a congregation at the end of the street. That's most likely. It's not that first there was Echo Street and then there was a congregation there. That's like trying to build a church, but first say, let me look at Pittsburgh and find a street named ch church. No. It's most likely the street is named Echoes because there is an ecclesia at the end of that street, right? So, ecclesia, echoes, ecclesiastes, all have to do with congregation. So, who is Yeshua in ecclesiastes? Okay, let me help you again, right? Let me help you again. Take your Bibles and please turn to the very first verse in Ecclesiastes. What does the very first verse in Ecclesiastes say? And just uh, blurt it out, whoever finds it out. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 1, what does that say? Yes. Ecclesiastes. One verse one says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Does Yeshua fit those words? Yes. Yeshua was a preacher. He is the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So who is Yeshua in Ecclesiastes? No. Yeshua is the preacher of the kingdom of Elohim. He's a preacher, right? And we know this why, because Matthew 9.35 tells us, And Yeshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Yes, he's, he's Solomon, but he's the preacher, most likely. He's the preacher. But now, Solomon, the preacher, right, he taught us that life is meaningless. But did Yeshua teach us that life is meaningless? Did Yeshua say that life is meaningless? Yes, he did. Yeshua taught us that life is meaningless without Yahweh. He taught us that life is meaningless without Yahweh. See, without Yahweh, life has no purpose. It's meaningless. Without Yahweh, life is meaningless. Yeshua taught us that what? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul in hell? 
what have you gained? If you're like Solomon, who had all the world, all the fame, all the beauty, but you lose your soul in hell. It has profited you nothing. You have gained nothing. That's why Yeshua taught us that do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, Solomon realized that all the wealth, the fame, the wisdom, the knowledge, the wives, and everything else he had acquired and accomplished was meaningless without Yahweh. Ecclesiastes 12.13 says the end of the matter, all has been said. Fear Elohim and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of man. The whole duty of man. Seek Yahweh first. Let him be your treasure. Everything you accomplish and acquire will mean nothing if Yahweh is not in it. Life without Yahweh is meaningless. All right. Let's recap now. Who is Yeshua from Genesis to Ecclesiastes? Yeshua in Genesis, the seed of the woman. Who is Yeshua in Exodus, the Passover lamb? Yes. Who is Yeshua in Leviticus, the great high priest? Who is Yeshua in Numbers, the smitten rock? Yes. Yeshua in Deuteronomy, prophet like Moses. Who is Yeshua in Joshua? Captain of Yahweh's host, yes. Who is Yeshua in Judges? The great and final judge. Yeshua in Ruth. The kinsman redeemer. Who is Yeshua in Samuel? The anointed one. Who is Yeshua in the kings? King of kings and Lord of lords, yes. Who is Yeshua in Chronicles? He is the glory filling the house of Yahweh, right? We are his temple, right? And Yeshua should fill this house. Yeshua should fill this house. He is the glory of the house of Elohim. Yeshua in the book of Ezra. Yes, the teacher come from Elohim. Yeshua in Nehemiah. Who is he? He rebuilds our broken lives, yes. And Yeshua in Esther. Yeah, the invisible protector of his people. Yeshua in Job. He is the sovereign Lord. Whatever he says happens. And Yeshua in the Psalms. Yeshua is the good shepherd. And Yeshua in the book of the Proverbs. The very wisdom of Elohim. And Yeshua in Ecclesiastes. The preacher of the kingdom of Elohim. May Yeshua be blessed forever and ever. Amen.